She was murdered, I tell you, Danfield. I found her at the bottom of Pitfall Cliff. You're sure she was murdered? Yeah, look at the wound in her neck. You'll see. I loved her, Doc. I've got $5,000 saved up. It's, it's all yours if you'll find out for me who murdered Dale. So I can kill him. Dr. Daniel Danfield, student of crime psychology, has many times provided the police with a solution to a baffling case. Today we find the alert doctor and his secretary, Rusty Fairfax, at a winter resort called Bald Eagle Lodge. The place is owned and operated by Chuck O'Connor and Red Martin, two skiing champions. Both Dan and Rusty are much interested in the famous legend of the Wendigo, a half-human, half-animal-like beast that roams the nearby forest, frightening natives with its moaning shriek. I think we should not have started out for the camera so late in the afternoon. And so? Yeah, why is it that you think such a thing? Look, the shadows grow long. Soon it will be dark. Eh, are we afraid of the dark, mon ami? It is not the dark alone, Jacques. It is the wind to go. Beyond lies the clearing at the end of which is Pitfall Cliff. <laughs> uh, so you have sinned then, eh? Have you forgotten that the Windigo, she only cries out to those who have sinned? Then you do not believe in the stories of the Windigo? You do not believe that there is a beast whose coat glows with the fiery light of a sunset? Whose moany scream lures sinners to their death over the edge of Pitfall Cliff? Ah, only a fool she would believe such tales, Renee. We, only a fool, and perhaps a sinner. A sinner fears only his own conscience. So, then perhaps it would have been best if... Listen! It is only the wind. Come, let us be on our way. No, it is more than the wind. It is... Look! Where? Oh, there is nothing. Oh, mon Dieu! It is the wind to go. See, there among the trees, a light. Oh, Mother of Mary. This, it cannot be so. It is a trick. No, no. It is the wind to go. It is calling to me. I must obey. Hey, Rene, come back, come back. It is calling to me. It knows I have sinned. There is no strength left in my body. Oh, mon Dieu, what thing is this? It is neither man nor beast. And yet his eyes should glow with the tongues of fire. Renee, come back. Come back, the cliff. She is just beyond. I cannot come back. I have sinned and I must obey. The wind that goes calling to me. That's the end of the story, folks. Whenever a man or woman has committed a great sin, the Wendigo comes forth from its lair and lures the sinner to Pitfall Cliff and pushes him over to his death. And if you don't believe me, just try committing a sin and find out. <laughs> <laughs> what a wonderful story. I've got goose nibbles for the past half hour. So have I. What does the Wendigo look like, Chuck? Well, it's half man and half beast, Rusty, and its coat glows in the darkness as though covered with phosphorus. Well, can it talk? Almost, although it's best known for its half-animal, half-human moaning shriek. Oh, I'd love to see it. Uh, don't push it, Rusty. Remember Pitfall Cliff. Dan Danfield, are you insinuating that I'm a sinner? <laughs> <laughs> All right, folks, strap on your skis. We'll head back to the lodge. Red will lead the way. Everybody stick close together, please. Take the last slope in easy stages. Oh, I'll be glad That's to get back. I'm Spanish. Yeah, all you have to do is become a sinner. <laughs> you all set, Red? Sure, any time. Light up, folks. Shouldn't somebody put out the fire? Well, Chuck will take care of that, Rusty. Your skis on tight? Sure, I'm all right. Okay, Red, shove off. Here we go, everybody. Follow me. Come on, Rusty, you first. I'm on my way. Come on, Dan. Right behind you. Down we go. Here we go. Here we go. Take it easy, everybody. Follow Red. Chuck. But Dale, I thought you'd... No. No, you didn't, Chuck. You knew I was standing over there under the pond. Did I? Yes. That's why you stayed behind. Chuck, is it... Is it all over? All over? I don't get it, Dale. Oh, Chuck, don't pretend. 
You've stopped loving me, haven't you? Dale, look. I'm the kind Haven't of you? I never did love you, Dale. But never did. You know, that's a lie, Chuck. You, you don't mean it. Even if I didn't, it wouldn't make any difference. Oh, I'm on a spot, Dale. I realized it three days ago. Realize what? That it was going to be impossible to reach you to explain how I feel. I, I don't understand. Believe me, Dale, I didn't mean to hurt you. If I'd suspected you were taking me seriously, I... Seriously? It's part of the job with me, Dale. It's what I get paid for. Oh. Most of the girls who come up here hope for a little, well, romance. Why, of all the cheap, rotten, dirty... And you think that's what my sister expects, too, don't you? Your sister? So, it was three days ago that you decided you were the great, strong, silent man of the outdoors. How coincidental, Chuck, that it was just three days ago that Kitty arrived at the lodge. Dale, are you implying that I'm not implying, Chuck. I'm telling you. Kitty was up here with you that night you heard the yapping of your so-called window. Oh, no. Whatever gave yes, you that. Yes, she was. See, I saw you start out together. Only it wasn't the ki yai of any mythical half-human mutt-dog that changed your mind. It was the cooing drivel and roving eyes of my two-timing sister. Stop it, Dale. You don't know what you're saying. I know exactly what I'm saying. I've had to put up with it all my life. Every date I've had, every man who's been interested in me, Kitty's taken away. She'd take them away and then laugh at me. And I'd have to take it and pretend I didn't mind. She... You sound like a child, a spoiled, selfish oh, brat. I didn't think it would matter, Chuck. Not with you. <laughs> you see, I thought you were different. I fell in love with you, Chuck. Dale, what are you doing? I don't care what happens now. I wish I were dead. I don't care. I don't care what happens. I wish I were dead. Dale, come back here. Dale, there's something I didn't tell you. moment we return for the second act of Danger, Dr. Danfield, but first... Now back to our star, Michael Dunn, for the second act of Danger, Dr. Danfield. Well, I feel better, Rusty. Anyone would feel better after a meal like that. Well, that story about the Wendigo didn't spoil your appetite, then. Huh? <laughs> oh, are you kidding? <laughs> it was an exciting story, though, wasn't it? Yes. yes. Well, here comes Red. And yeah, looks serious. Hope nothing has happened to Dale and Chuck. Hello, Doc. Rusty. Uh, can I see a minute? Why, well, sure, Red. What's the... What's uh, no, no. Outside in the office. It's important. All right. I'll be right along. Uh, Rusty, you stay right No, here. I'm coming, too. But this might be a private matter. I hope it is. I'm sick of these public matters. By that, I suppose you mean that because I've been polite to Kitty Thorndike... Yes, you... I do. You're doing it just to make Through me jealous. Door, oh, thanks, Red. Go ahead, Rusty. Chuck's private office is over here. Oh, then Chuck's back? Yeah. Go in, please. Well, hello, Chuck. Glad you're back. We thought that Dad, probably... Look on the couch. That's Dale. What happened, Chuck? She's dead. Dead? Oh, no, Dan. Let me take a look here. Yeah, she is dead. Wait a minute. There must be a mistake. Dan is... I know what he is. You're a detective, aren't you, Doctor? At times. Why? Dale was murdered. Murdered? Now, well, just a minute. Making a statement like she that... She was murdered, I tell you. I found her at the bottom of Pitfall Cliff. She was struck in the neck with the steel point of a ski pole and pushed over. You're sure? Yes, look at her neck, you'll see. I loved her, Doc. I've got $5,000 saved up. 
It's all yours if you'll find out for me who murdered Dale. So I can kill him. Dan, won't the police be annoyed when they discover the way we've messed up all the schema? Well, they probably will, Rusty, but it can't be helped. There are some things I want to check. It seems to me we're really sticking our noses into something. Oh, does it, Rusty? Now, let's leave our skis here. That's the edge of Pitfall Cliff over there. You know, Dan, I just thought of something. Mm -hmm. Did you? What's that? Suppose there is such a thing as a windigo. Suppose that last night... Stand your skis upright in the snow, huh, Rusty? Mm. That's good. All right, now let's go. Now, uh, what were you saying, Rusty? Well, suppose last night Dale Thorndyke heard the cry of the windigo and was lured to the edge of Pitfall Cliff and fell over. Well, that would certainly be a convenient solution of the problem, wouldn't it? Oh, careful here now. Yes, there's one set of ski marks coming in from the south. Here's another coming down the slope from the west. Dan, you really didn't believe that story about the windigo, did you? Mm -hmm. Windigo? Of course. Let me see now. Skier coming from the west was moving fast. He christied to a full stop right here beside the other set of tracks. Oh, but, Dan, it was such a fantastic story. Who ever heard of a windigo? Oh, stand back, will you, Rusty? Yes, this is what I've been looking for. The marks of two ski poles in the snow. Of course, at the time, I pretended to believe it just to please Chuck. I didn't really. Yes, sir, this is exactly what I hoped for. Look here, Rusty. What for? I don't Look see. at the imprint made by this ski pole. The mm. steel point was obviously four-sided. Well? Now look at the one over here. It was made by a five-sided point. Does that prove something? I think it might. The doctor who was called from the village will be able to tell us what kind of a ski pole made the wound in Dale Thorndyke's neck. And? Well, the point of most ski poles, Rusty, are four-sided. We have the poles that Dale was using. Now, if it turns out that they were four-sided, it'll mean that the person who was using the five-sided pole is our murderer. Well, that's fine. But how are you going to tell who was using the five-sided pole? I don't know. Let's take one step at a time, though, shall we? Right now, the thing to do is get hold of Chuck or Red and ask them to show us the skiing equipment that Bald Eagle Lodge provides for its guests. room here, Doc. You can help yourself. Thanks, Fred. I'll start looking, will you, Rusty? Okay, but it's going to take quite a while. There's an awful lot of poles here. Uh, what is it you're looking for? A pair of poles with five-sided points. Five-sided? Yes. Tell me, Red, do you happen to know whether any of these poles have that type of point? No, I, I never noticed there was any difference in them. So what's it going to prove if you find one? Well, the person who pushed Dale over the cliff was using a pole with a five-sided point. Dale herself was using one with a four-sided point. You don't say. Yes. Now, as soon as we have the doctor's report, we'll know definitely that we're right. Oh, uh, how are you doing, Rusty? Every pole I've looked at so far is a four-sided pole. Hey, Doc, uh, wait a minute. Suppose you're right. How are you going to prove who was carrying the pole? Don't ask embarrassing questions, Red. We don't know. Well, there's a good chance that if there's only one pair of five-sided poles in this bunch, there might be something distinguishing about the shaft, too. Well, there could be, but look, uh, a lot of our guests bring their own equipment. You'll have to look that stuff over, too. Well, that's right, Red. I'm glad you thought of it. Well, hello, Chuck. Come in. Have you got the doctor's report yet? Yeah. You were right, Doc. It was a five-sided point that caused the wound. Hmm. Well, that takes care of the first step. Oh, uh, find something, Rusty? I think so. Yes. Look, the point on this pole has five sides. Oh. And here's the mate to it. Well, good work, Rusty. Yeah, that blasts the theory, doesn't it? This pair of poles looks just like all the others. How about fingerprints? Well, a person who's skiing, Rusty, usually wears gloves. No, I've got a better idea. Chuck, about your Windigo story... I suppose that's more or less a local legend. No, I just read about it somewhere and decided a story like that, if told in the proper setting, would amuse our guests. It pays off, too. The way Chuck tells it, everyone gets a bang out of hearing it. Hmm. Yes, it did sound very convincing. Uh, tell me, who owns Bald Eagle Lodge? Red and I do. We both did a lot of skiing in college, and when we got out, we decided to pool what money we had and open a lodge. Well, we had more to pool than money. Chuck used to be in a collegiate champion. A lot of people come up here just to see what he looks like. Yes, I, uh, 
noticed that. Well, thanks for giving me this information. Without it, I'm afraid I wouldn't be able to tell you who the murderer is. Tell us who the murderer is? Do you mean you know? Yes, I think so. Rusty, will you and Red take these ski poles out to the police chief and explain to him what we've discovered, please? Chuck, I'd like to talk to you alone. In a moment, we'll return for the third act of Danger, Dr. Danfield. But first... Now back to Michael Dunn for the third act of... Danger, Dr. Danfield. I don't care what you say, Dan. I think it's a terrible idea. Oh, do you, Rusty? Yes, I do. And I don't think it's right to ask Kitty Thorndyke to help. Don't you? Well, let's see. Number 28. Yes, this is Kitty's room here. Well? Well? Aren't you going to knock? Yes, yes, just as soon as you leave. Just as soon as I leave, do you think for one minute I'd let you go into that room alone? Well, I won't be alone. Kitty's in there. Oh, aren't you the one, though, Danny? <laughs> There'll be three of us all together. Oh, um... Come in. She means both of us, I'm sure. Mm. Oh, it's Miss Fairfax and Dan. Come in. Hello, Kitty. I uh, hope you'll pardon us barging in on you this way, but what we have to say is rather important. Well, then it can only concern one thing. Dale. Yes, that's right. I told Dan I didn't think it was very considerate of him to question you at a time like this, Miss Thorndyke. Oh, it's all right. As a matter of fact, I've been expecting Dan to ask me questions. After all, Dale was my sister, and I... I want to do everything I can to help find yes, out... Yes, yes, of course. Uh, tell me, Kitty, is there anything particular that you remember about your sister as a child? Nothing, except that she was much cuter than I... So she got more attention. Are you older than Dale? Yes, but only by 13 months. And there were only two of you? Yes, just Dale and me. Is your family wealthy? Uh, by that I mean, was there anything that Dale ever wanted terribly but couldn't have because your folks couldn't afford to buy it for her? Oh, no. Dale and I couldn't have had a nicer childhood. Of course, sometimes there were things that we wanted and couldn't have. But there was nothing that might have left a lasting impression on her mind, if that's what you mean. That's exactly what I mean. You uh, seem to know a good deal about psychology, Kitty. Well, I studied it in college. Well, that's fine. It'll help you understand the suggestion I'm going to make. I'll try. Thank you. Now, the police have forbidden any of the guests to leave the lodge or even to go out on their skis since your sister's death. However, I think I can persuade them to let Chuck and Red take a group up to Pitfall Cliff for one of their famous storytelling parties. Dan, that seems almost indecent so soon. Well, perhaps it does, Rusty, but I think it's going to help us apprehend the murderer. Kitty, I want you to go along with the group. But why? After all, as Rusty That's just says... the point. There will be a lot of the guests who won't want to go out of respect to Dale, even though they're all restless after two days of inactivity. I see. And you think that... If I go along, the others will feel all right about going, too. Yes, that's it, exactly. And I don't see how you're going to prove anything. Rusty and I were up at Pitfall Cliff today. We found the marks made by the skier who pushed Dale to the edge. Those marks, Kitty, were made by a pair of skis that had a slight flaw in the steel edges. What? Of course, we have no way of telling who wore the skis, but it's my guess that the person who did wear them will instinctively choose the same pair when making tonight's trip. That's right. I always do. It saves adjusting new bindings. And you think that by watching the marks in the snow, you can tell who pushed Dale over the cliff? Yes. So you see how important it is that we have all the people who made up the group two nights ago along on this trip. Yes. Yes, I see what you mean. Very well, Dan. You can count on me. Keep in mind, everyone. We're herring going up the slope and enter the woods at the big pine. I wish we started in daylight. Oh, it isn't very dark. The moon will be above the trees in a few minutes. Where's Red? He's at the end of the line. You all right, Kitty? Yes, I'm fine. Rusty? Oh, sure. 
Oh, sure. Don't mind me. You don't have to be so sarcastic. Well, the way you're paying attention to Mr. Forget Tony. it, forget it. You bring along the flashlight? Yes. But I won't do any good to study the tracks while we're all in line this way, but as soon as we enter the woods... Oh, you, you don't have to remind me. I know what to do. All right, folks. Close it up now. We're coming into the woods. It'll be darker. Aren't Chuck and Red going to build a fire? Yes, there's a clearing just beyond the pine, and beyond that is the edge of Pitfall Cliff. Oh, Dan, I hope your plan works. It will. Don't worry. Well, here we are. We'll stop and rest a while before we begin the run. Better take off your skis. Uh, use your flashlight, Rusty. Pretend you're having trouble with the vines. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Get some wood, will you, Red? You bet, Chuck. You're going to tell us the story of the Windigo, Chuck? Well, why should he do that? We heard it only two nights ago. Well, considering everything that's happened, I'm uh, against it. Well, <laughs> it provides the proper atmosphere. How do you feel about it, Kitty? Oh, it doesn't matter to me. Say, isn't it around here somewhere that the Windigo is supposed to begin prowling, looking for sinners? Yes, according to the legend, he's supposed to live in a cave over there at the top of the cliff. Well, let's hear it. There aren't any sinners among us. Uh, what if he does appear? I can almost see its phosphorescent coat glowing through the trees. Rusty. Well, I can. Oh, come on, Chuck. Maybe the Windigo gets sore if we don't give it the proper amount of attention and listen. <laughs> Don't let your imagination run away with you, Rusty. It's only the wind. Well, maybe it is, but I've got goose symbols already. Wait. Listen again. That isn't the wind. Well, what else could it be? It could be the wind to go. Dan, look. Good heavens. There's a light over there among the trees. Well, don't get alarmed, folks. It's probably only red. Hey, red! It isn't red. Well, of course it isn't. He, he couldn't make a light like that. Oh, Dan, I'm scared. It's... It's the Wendigo! Look. It, it's an animal! It is the Wendigo! Look at the way its body crouches. Don't be silly. There isn't any such thing as the Wendigo. Oh, no? Well, I'm getting out of here. Stay where you are. It, it's coming toward us. Listen. for the conclusion of Danger, Dr. Danfield, but first... Now for the conclusion of... Danger, Dr. Danfield. Well, here we are at the top of the slope, Rusty. Let's, uh, let's rest a minute, huh? Oh, it suits me. And while we're resting, you can finish telling me how you dreamed up that Wendigo gag. Well, it wasn't my idea entirely. Chuck helped me. He provided the phosphorus, and Red fixed himself up in an old fur coat and agreed to make a noise like a Wendigo. Oh, I hope I never have to hear that yell of his again, <laughs> or the story. I still don't see why you suspected Kitty in the first place. Well, there were a lot of reasons. First of all, those five-sided poles are rather small, a type that would be used by a woman. Well, then why did you tell her about the skis with the flaw on their steel edges? Well, let's see what she'd do. She deliberately selected another pair of skis, but instinctively took the same pole she'd been using. Mm-hmm. And, uh, is that all you had to go on? No, no, no. Kitty's hatred of her sister stemmed from a fixation that she acquired as a child. Dale was a pretty baby and therefore got more attention. And the bitterness and hatred was established in Kitty's subconscious mind even then. And without her realizing it, it kept building itself up. 
And then when they got older, Kitty turned out to be the prettier of the two. Yes. Subconsciously, she began getting her revenge by taking Dale's men away from her. Just for the satisfaction it gave her, mm -hmm. huh? She tried it with Chuck, but uh, unknown to Dale, Chuck turned her down cold. He really loved Dale. So Kitty, unable to control the hatred of her sister, pushed Dale over the cliff. Yes, that's right. No one, of course, will ever know the exact circumstances of how it happened. And, uh... If it hadn't been for Chuck's Wendigo story, we'd probably have had a time proving Kitty guilty. Well, at least the legend of the fabulous Wendigo served one good purpose. Do you still think the legend of the Wendigo is the legend? Oh, of course I do. You know, it's almost as legendary as, uh, well, some of the things you tell me. Is that a fact? Mm -hmm. Uh, Rusty, come here a minute. Yes, Dan? Legendary, huh? Just a tip of your chin. Mm-hmm. Oh, darn those skis. They were never made for old man.